We're going to begin in Exodus this morning. Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, and three different references, three different references in Exodus, three different chapters. Uh, the title of the message here, coming down from the mountaintop, a message I've sort of preached, I think it was about eight, nine years ago, because every time I uh, preach a message over, it never turns out quite the same. And so that's true of this one also. Coming down from the mountaintop. And really there's kind of two kinds of applications can be made here. Number one, it is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth. Moses coming off the mountaintop. There's many parallels here. There's many situations that will be the same. So Moses coming down from the mountaintop, uh, from Mount Sinai, from the mountaintop, uh, there's many parallels, many similarities to when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. It'll be a time when there's a great division, divided the people, as Moses divided the people here too. There'll be a time of judgment, a time of judgment, great judgment, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. He's coming back from Mount Sinai, a very holy place. Jesus Christ is coming back from a very holy place, heaven. Absolute holiness in heaven. No sin in heaven at all. At all. Real important. Coming down from the mountain. Now, so that's one application. But the other application is to, for uh, Christians. For us. And this is the one I'm going to mainly use in my message this morning. The one coming down from the mountaintop. And what, what does a mountaintop experience mean? Well, what I'm talking about here, what is meant by this, is when a Christian has a special personal time with God. And the differences and what will be evidence of that. When a Christian has a special, personal time with God. Now we do that through reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God. You cannot have a special, personal time with God without His Word. Amen. Good. Can I say that this morning? Yes. Yeah. People think, well, I felt this way, and I felt, well, feelings can be good, or they can be misleading, too. Right. And I think feelings more, more often than not mislead people. They don't lead them in the right way. And they're really not an evidence, although the right feelings are an evidence, too, uh, of a good thing spiritually. But to have a personal spiritual time with God, it's got to have His Word there. Amen. If you want to have a special personal time with somebody, one-on-one, -on -one, but not talk. Is that even possible? And not communicate. Is that even possible? No. There has to be communication. To have a relationship with somebody and a communication, it has to be a way to communicate words and so forth. Words mainly. Same thing here too. So what is meant by a mountaintop experience? What am I trying to get at this morning? It's when that person has a special personal time with God, what then will be an evidence of that? How do you know what will happen when you have a special, personal time with God? What will be the evidence of that if that has taken place? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. What a privilege it is. What an honor it is. And what a responsibility it is, Lord. Please help me to preach well this morning. Please, please help me. Please help me to preach. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. 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 Exodus chapter 32 will start there. There will be three different references. I'm sorry, Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verse number 12 is where we'll start. In Exodus 30, 24, I really want to get to Exodus 32. Can you help me? <laughs> recognize that? Exodus 24, and verse 12 is where we'll start this morning. And these are the directions that God gives to Moses for to go up to the mountaintop here. Exodus 24, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. There's the place. I like that place. Place we need to be. Uh, again, you're in the right place this morning. Amen. To be the mount and be there. That's where I want you to be. And I will give thee now. Once you're there, when you're there. But if you're not there, you won't get this. But if you are there, you will get this. I will give thee tables of stone and the law and commandments which I have written. God himself wrote these laws. That thou mayest teach them. He gives them to Moses to teach to others. 
And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and they said unto the elders, Tarry ye here until we come again unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Now there's the problem, because Moses is going to be gone, as well as problems come up, which we'll be reading about here. And behold, Aaron and Hur with thee, if any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. So in other words, don't come to me personally. I'm going to be up in this mountaintop. If you have some problems, you've got to talk to somebody, talk to them about it. And Moses went up into the mount, and the cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. The glory of the Lord was there. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. It's like this great mountain was on fire. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got up into the mountain. Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Now what's going to happen in 40 days, during the 40 days and 40 nights? A lot's going to happen. Not good. Not good either. Now where Moses is, a lot of good's going to happen. But where Israel is, a lot of bad's going to happen. Now let's go to my beloved chapter 32 in Exodus. Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 7. The problems come up. God tells Moses about it. Exodus chapter 32 verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people. That's, I've heard that preach there. God's, these are your people. These are not my people. Thy people, which are brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They corrupt themselves. They have turned aside quickly. It didn't take them long. Once Moses was gone, it didn't take them long to go the wrong way and do the wrong things. They have turned aside quickly. I have that word quickly underlined in my Bible, bread. They turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf. And they have worshipped it, the molten calf, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Where do they get the idea of having molten calves to worship? Well, that was part of Egypt. Egypt yeah. situation there. Uh, and out of the land there. Now verse 15. Verse 15. Still in Exodus chapter 32. Verse 15 now. And by the way, in verse 11 there. In verse 11 we see the prayer of Moses. I find it interesting that Moses prayed and then he got angry. I find, I find the sequence there interesting. In verses 11 through 14, you see Moses' prayer. We'll be referring to that here a little, in a little bit, too. But it was after that, after he prayed, he got angry. He didn't get angry and then pray. He prayed and then got angry. I think that's kind of interesting. But I want to read in verse number, beginning of verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. So he's coming down off the mountaintop now. The tables are written on both their sides. On the one side, on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. The work of God. And the writing was the writing of God himself. God, why, well, and work himself. Graven upon the tables. Amen. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, and as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. That's what it sounded like to Joshua. Verse 18. And he said, Moses said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, like those that have won a victory in battle, Neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, losers in a battle. But the noise of them that sing, <laughs> do I hear? Yep. When does singing sound like somebody's having a battle or fight? Yep. Well, kind of like the music today, isn't it? Yes. Yes. When does music sound this way? When does music sound like there's a war going on? Mm -hmm. yeah. The way things change, they always come back to the same things, don't they? Yes. Then that sing, do I hear? Now verse 19. And came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and, and Moses. So there's, there's music here in their worship. There's music and dancing in worship. Worshiping calves, worshiping idols. There's music in worshiping idols. There's dancing in worshiping idols. Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast his tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mounds. I thought, I don't know what that is significant of. I always found that interesting. That was the writing of God that he had on those tablets. And he got so angry, he threw them down, and they broke right there. I'm not sure what that means, but I find it interesting, though. And then verse 20, 
And he took the calf, which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and shrouded the pound of water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. I mean, Moses really took control. He came back with a vengeance, didn't he? He came back with a boldness he maybe never had before. And he made them drink. Moses was called the most meek man on earth. Uh, God himself it said that Moses was meek. Now here's a meek, here's evidence of a meek man in verse 20. <laughs> a meek man in verse 20. He took the calf which they had been and made and burned it in the fire, ground it in the power, strawed it on the water, made the children of Israel drink of it. Drink of that. Like you might take, tell your kids, you gotta take this medicine. You gotta drink this. Now verse 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou brought so great a sin upon them? Aaron, what in the world are you doing here? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of thy Lord wax hot. Well, too late for that. Thou knowest the people. So Aaron's going to blame someone else, of course. Blame the people. That they are set on mischief. And they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is becoming. We don't know what happened. Maybe he's been gone. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold at the break, he goes along with it. Aaron, Aaron, don't do this. I, every time I read through this, I think about this. Aaron, what are you doing? What are you doing? You were like first, first lieutenant to Moses himself. How can you fall this fast? Why are you listening to the people? Why? And I said unto them, Whoso had any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this gap. Wow. Come on, you expect us to believe that, Aaron. You really expect us to believe this? It just happened this way. This calf came out of the fire. No, no. And when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out of the gate, and gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother. Wow. And every man his companion. And every man his neighbor. This sin brought a death sentence on them. Verse 28. And the children of Israel, the Levi, did according to the word of Moses, and there fell the people that day about 3,000 men. 3,000 men were killed there. Now, I don't know exactly what the scene looked like. Did the men, men tried to defend themselves? I don't know. Maybe God has special blood. I don't know what it was, but 3,000 men killed because they worshiped wrongly, because they fell back and started worshiping idols. Okay. Point taken this, this morning. What will be different after a person has a mountaintop experience? And what is meant by a mountaintop experience? What I'm calling here a mountaintop experience. When they have a personal, special time with God, there will be evidence of that. Evidence when they've been with God. By the way, it's kind of interesting in verses 12 through 18, the word up is used four times. We go up to be with the Lord. They come down to be with the world and the world's yeah. people. Well, let's get, let me get through my seven, six points this morning. Number one, what is true? What was the evidence? Number one, what Moses hears as well as what he sees angers him. It's all right to get angry at the right times. He got angry after he prayed, like I said. There is such a thing as a righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. And there's such a thing as because Moses had this privilege of being the man, God's man here. A special thing. Now, we don't go around breaking up churches and, and busting down Jehovah's Witnesses Assembly Hall and, and breaking the Catholic Church and, and taking a sledgehammer to their idols, although that would be fun. <laughs> I want to make this clear to this point. God has not called us to do that. We're fighting a spiritual battle here. Yes. We want to reach them. We want to reach them with the gospel, the real gospel. But it made him angry, yeah. and it also emboldened him. Yeah. It gave him anger, it gave him some boldness to carry out what he, what he had to do or what he did do. But he got angry after he prayed. He got angry about what he heard and what he saw. Mm -hmm. And he had to do something about it. As Christians, we don't do these kind of things, but we, we need to get angry about them. Right. We need to get angry about the things we see happen, happening in our country. Amen. We need to get angry about the false prophets, so many false prophets. Yeah. And we need to do the right thing. We need to fight, fight the spiritual battle. Amen. 
We don't take a sword to anybody. But we fight the spiritual battle. We pray for them. We witness to them. We plead with them to get saved. We have to fight the spiritual battle. And then we are like Moses. And we need his boldness. And we need his, his uh, righteousness. And we need his indignation too. Christian, we need that. We need to get wound up again. We need that kind of revival. We need that kind of awakening. To get wound up. Where you've gone off into uh, lethargy. That's the word, lethargy. Isn't that a good word? Things we're half asleep in what we do for the Lord. Yeah. We need to get excited about those things. And we need to follow through and be obedient. But he got angry by what he heard. Mm -hmm. That was part of their worship. Dancing. We do not dance in our churches. Hey. Okay. Nowhere in the Bible, New Testament, does it say we need to be dancing. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they, they leaped for joy. And when David danced in the Old Testament, he did not do the moonwalk. <laughs> right. He did not even dance the waltz. Right. Yep. What kind of dancing did David do in the Old Testament? Just a leaping for joy. That's all that was. It was a leaping for joy. It wasn't any kind of dance. Although the word dance is used. It was a leaping for joy. So we leap for joy. We're glad. We're glad about the Lord. It makes us happy, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Now, as we consider these things, what made him angry? What he heard and what he saw. What he heard, the kind of music, what he saw, what they were doing there. Now, they were worshiping a golden calf. They wouldn't do that in the church like this. But they were worshiping a golden calf. But he prays and emboldens him to act in these areas. You can tell when a person's been on the mountaintop. It emboldens them. Mm -hmm. They have a concern for people. They have a righteous indignation. Righteous indignation. So that's how you know. Number two. What happens? Uh... Things have gotten worse while he was up there on the mountain. Forty days, forty nights, that's not a that's not a long time. How quickly, how quickly Israel sinned. How quickly they fell back on their ways, uh, uh, the old ways, the Egyptian ways. Uh, how quickly they fell back in those things. Do we see the world getting better today, friends? No, sir. Let me ask you this. Do we even see our churches getting better? No, sir. It's just sad to see things going on, even in some of our good Baptist churches. Yeah, right. it, it seems like every change they make now is not for the better. Right, right. It's, it's not a, a, a holier stand. No. It's not a stand of more separation in different no. areas that we need to be separated from the world. We see the church uh, getting more and more like the world, like that saying right. says. The church set out to convert the world, but the world is converting the church. Right. Is that a problem? Big problem. Yes, sir. We need to be different. We need to be th different in our, our worship. But things have gotten worse. <laughs> it got worse. Why is it that churches seem to run down? Very seldom do they run up. Up. Four times the word up was used when Moses went up to the mountaintop. But he went down to the people. Up and down. Things have gotten worse. Our country's gotten worse. We need to pray for our country. We need to set the right example. Because our country needs to realize the solution to our problems are spiritual. Right. Amen. If people would get right with the Lord, then the Lord would work in our nation. Amen. If you want to get uh, America saved, you got to save America. As Lester Olaf's quote, I think that's a good one. It's a spiritual a solution there, a spiritual remedy. Get people, witness to people, bring them out to church. That, that's what is needed. By the way, things have gotten worse. When Moses was gone, things got worse. Moses is a type of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ left, things got worse. Now he's coming back. Praise the Lord, Christian, he's coming back. But things have gotten worse at that time, and they're getting worse now, too. But let me say this. Don't let that discourage you. Christian, don't let that scare you. Amen. God's still in control. Right. Just stay on his side. In fact, serve him even more. Right. How can you do that? Uh, I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to church. I'm with this Okay, well, keep at it. Don't stop. Don't slow down. In fact, speed up. Amen. Put your foot to the accelerator. Hey. Let's get going. Yes. Let's get going faster than we ever have before. Because the need is great, isn't yes. it? The need is great. What's the third thing we true when you've been on the mountaintop? You'll see there's a need for a public stand. There's a need for the public stand. Moses, when he came back, he made them choose. Oh, which verse is it? I know it's in chapter 32, because that's my favorite verse. 
Uh, verse 30, 26, I think it is. Verse 26. Oh yeah, verse 26. Exodus 20, 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Amen. Okay, it's time to make a public stand. Yep. He made them choose four against. They couldn't hide with the crowd anymore. You ever been in that position where you've been forced to take a stand for the Lord? Uh, it might have been a little awkward, it might, might have been a little difficult, but you, you were in a place where you had to say something. There's times when I'm around different places, and of course, the world, the worldly people, they so many of them have foul mouths. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. And sometimes I'll say something about it. Good. Or I'll just say, yeah, well, I want to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Andy. I'm Andrew Stagway. I pastor a Baptist church in Newton, Ohio. Amen. I want to invite you to our church. Amen. Usually it shakes them up a little bit because they, they know what they've done. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor, I said those words. Yeah. Why do they know that's wrong? Yeah. How do they know that's wrong? Right. And why, if they know it's wrong, don't they change? Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't they not say those words? They know it's wrong, and yet they say those words, even though they know it's wrong. Yeah. And it doesn't even take a pastor uh, confronting them or talk to them to make them feel guilty. They know it's wrong already, but they still say those words anyway. Mm -hmm. Why is that strange, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because they made a choice with their free will. But they made a choice. Here, here's an interesting thought in verse 26. Let me read it again. I want to point out something that I find very intriguing here. Uh, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Okay, now, those are those. Let him come unto me. Only those who are on the Lord's side were to move. Look at it there. Only those that are, who was on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. Okay, here's, a, here's the whole bunch of people, whole group of people here. Those that are on the Lord's side, come up here right now. Amen. If you stay back there, yeah. you're not on the Lord's side. That's good, man. Only those that are on the Lord's side had to move, were to move. Who was on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. And all of a sudden the Levi gathered themselves together unto him. See, sometimes you have to make a public stand. Sometimes you have to take a stand for the Lord publicly. Okay, who is gonna, who's against, who is, uh, 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 oh, how can I illustrate this? Who, who, who is in the city, where, okay, we're having a, a city council meeting. Who in the city council here wants to have another bar in Euclid, Ohio? Uh, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to have another bar? That, we don't need another bar in Euclid, Ohio, do we? we? We have enough bars in the city of Euclid already. But you have to take a stand. You have to vote one way or the other. That's what Moses was saying here. Okay, if you're on my side, then come up here right now. Let everybody know you're on my side. You're not back with them. Those that don't want to come forward here, they're part of the group. And they show and reveal that they're not on God's side by not moving. They show they're not on God's side by not moving. By staying where they are. One little illustration, an example, is when we give an invitation. People show where they are by not moving. People have visited our church. Maybe they're even under conviction, but... They, when the invitation is given, they don't move, they stay where they are. Now, this is a church, a little different situation, of course, but I found that interesting. Only those who are on the Lord's side were to move by Moses. Those that are against this and don't agree with this and don't want this, stay where you are. Don't move. The Christians, we, we need to move. People need to move. And also, take a public stand. Don't blend in, Christian. Don't blend in. Amen. We need to stand out, we need to be different, we need to be better. Right, man. We need to stand out, we need to be different, we need to be better. Don't blend in. And Moses wasn't one of the separation. He's coming over on this side. And of course, Christians are going to look different, they're going to act different, they're going to even dress different than the world. We're to stand out, be different, and be better. Don't blend in. <laughs> Don't blend in. Now, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we need to be Amish. That, that, that's going a little too far, I think, on things. But we need to be different on this. Moses said, come on next to me. Move. If you're going to stand with me, if you're going to stand on the Lord's side, you're going to have to move. Let the others stay back to where they are. But you need to move. Stand up. Be different. Be better. 
Don't look like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't talk like the world. Don't go where the world goes. Go where Christians go. Look like a Christian. Act like a Christian. Talk like a Christian. There is a difference. There is to be separation. So know what the public said. He made himself, okay, time's here. Which side are you on? If you're on my side, if you're on the Lord's side, come on out from amongst them. You're not among them anymore. Now you're separate. Come out separate. I like verse 26. I hope you like it a little bit more than you ever, ever did before, too. Then Moses stood in the gate of Gavin and said, Who is it? Who is on the Lord's side? That's right. Let them come up to me, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Move away from the group. Move away from the pack, so to speak. So that's one. Take a public stand. The next one is kind of interesting. Others will recognize where there's been a difference. Others will recognize that you're different. Now we're going to go to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, beginning at verse 29. Exodus 34, verse 29. After Moses came back again from the Mount, Mount Sinai. And it came to pass, Exodus 34, verse 29. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, Moses wist not, wist not means he didn't understand, he didn't realize that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were, they were afraid to come nigh. See, Christian, you're going to make people feel uneasy. When you've had these mountaintop experiences, so to speak, you've had personal special times with God Almighty, and there's evidence of that, there's differences because of that, you're not gonna, they're not gonna feel comfortable in your company. Right. Well, when you walk into a room, maybe at a family reunion or get together or something like that, uh, even maybe at work too, because they know you're Christian at work, hopefully they do, uh, they're gonna, gonna change their attitude, they're gonna change their actions maybe, and they're gonna change their words because you're there now. That's right. And you make them feel uncomfortable. It's in the skin, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. They didn't want to come, come close to him. This is one of the reasons people don't come out to church. They don't want to come out to church. They're afraid to. Right. Can you believe that? People are afraid to come out to church. Mm -hmm. Lost people are afraid to come out to church because they don't feel all that comfortable here. Because what they hear here, they're not going to hear somewhere else. Yeah, that, that makes sense. They're not, what they hear here, they're not going to hear somewhere else. Right. And they're afraid to come out to church. That's why you have to kind of overcome those fears. You can say this about our church. Well, when you get there, you will feel welcome. Our church is a friendly church. Mm -hmm. And it is. I want to keep it going that way, too. I, I think it will. Yeah. But they're going to feel uneasy around you, even a little bit fearful about coming out to church. Because what they hear here and what they see here is not what they, makes them feel comfortable. They will feel guilty. They will feel maybe convicted. They'll hear about the glorious God that God is and His forgiveness. They'll hear about the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even that scares them. Can you believe that? Yeah. The love of God scares people. Wow. Hearing about God's love because they know there's more to it than God's love. There's also God's holiness like we heard about a little bit this morning already too. And they don't feel comfortable. They're afraid to come out to church. So try to encourage them, of course, and hopefully they'll be interested and come out. Hopefully they'll hear the gospel, and hopefully they'll surrender and be saved at our church. That'd be a wonderful thing. But one of the reasons, one of the reasons people don't come out of the church, they're afraid to. They just don't feel comfortable here. They're reminded about eternal things. And they're trying to block that out of their minds. Right, right. But they're reminded of eternal things. Yeah. Afraid to come nigh unto him. And then verse 31. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and the rulers of the congregation returned with him. And Moses talked with them, and afterwards all the children of Israel came by, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So they will recognize when a person's been with the Lord. They feared three reactions. Three reactions. They feared, they stood back, and they couldn't look at him. You ever notice that? You went to somebody talking about something that convicts them, they'll look away. Mm -hmm. They'll look away from you. Sure. Because they feel uncomfortable. They look away. Mm -hmm. They look away. They won't look at you. 
They look at you, mean, they're listening, that's good. But uh, when they look away, that shows something. Just three reactions, because Moses, his face lit and shone this way. They feared, they stood back, and they couldn't look at him. Number five in the outline this morning, what takes place when a person has a mountaintop experience is you can go to the mountaintop more than once. I like this. You can go more than once. You can have the special times with God more than once. The first time, God, uh, Moses came back. He broke the, ten, the, the commandments. Uh, second time, he went back up there again. Second time. And every time we're with the Lord, it's a special time, isn't it? We can go back to the Mount Sinai. So we can go be with the Lord more than once. More than once. Praise the Lord. We can go back time and time again. In fact, God wants us to. Encourages us to do those things. We can go back to the mountaintop, go back again and again and again. It's kind of like when you go to the bank and you've got a savings there, maybe, or a checking account. You can go back more than once to the bank. If you need more money, go to the bank. If you need to make a deposit, go to the bank. If you need more money, go to the bank. You gotta pay your bills, go to the bank. You can go more than once. You can go more than once to the Lord. It only takes one time to get saved, but after that you can have these special mountaintop experiences. Just you and the Lord. A special place. A place that changes you. A place that's exciting. A place that will make you a better Christian. Mountaintop experiences. So you can go back time and time and time again. Last point this morning. You can't stay on the mountaintop. You can't stay there. Moses came down. He was there 40 days, 40 nights. But then he came down. Why? Because God has called us to do something you cannot do on the mountaintop. On the mountaintop, it's just you and God. On the mountaintop, you might even say like a church service, but you're with other Christians. God has called us to do a work, and a work that can't be done on the mountaintop. The mountaintop will embolden us. The mountaintop will bless us. The mountaintop will make us stronger. The mountaintop will renew our, our standards and our separation, our sanctification. The mountaintop will do all those things. But a mountaintop is not where our work, the work that God has called us to do can be done. We have to come off the mountaintop into the world. Now, I'm not saying you start to act like the world. I'm just saying Moses came down from the mountaintop. That's where he found all the problems. The problems were not at the mountaintop. Right. He was getting the commandments there, having special revelation of the Lord there, special blessings there, and uh, but he had to come down here. And here's where the work that needed to be done needed to be done here in this down here in this world. Like we said, tomorrow you're going to go back to work. That's where the work needs to be done. That's where the people are. You're going to be Moses tomorrow morning when you go to work if you're working a job. You are Moses. You're the one to bring the right kind of message. Lead the right kind of life. Even convict people by how you live. But you can't stay on the mountaintop. God's work, evangelizing, personal evangelizing, living a Christian life, a Christian example, isn't done on the mountaintop. It's done in this world. We are to be light and salt. Light in a dark world spiritually. We're to be salt. Salt has different applications, different definitions. But salt preserves. Salt makes thirsty, doesn't it? Those are some of the important things that salt does. And so we're to be light and salt in this world. We need to come down the mountaintop. It's a shame we could, we could stay in church for seven days a week. I just hear preaching. We never, never get tired, so we never have to take naps or sleep or anything. Where we never get tired. We can stay in church all day, but you can't. Monday morning comes, doesn't it? Monday morning comes. You gotta be back there at the bottom of the mountaintop, back there amongst all those people, but you need to live that separated life, that sanctified life, that life that God gives you, that different kind of life, that kind of evidence. Evidence. Coming from the mountaintop. What am I saying here? Well, let's see, there was one more verse. Yeah, uh, I don't know, one more verse I wanted to bring away. I can't remember which one it was right now. But here's what I want to talk about. Having a personal mountaintop experience with God where you're alone with God, you learn His Word, you come back better, 
And you act like Moses. You act like Moses. Coming back from the mountaintop, the mountaintop. What Moses heard and saw angered him, and it does bother us Christians, doesn't it? We see that things are getting worse. You look at our country, and it's downright scary. Yeah. Because things are getting worse. We know we need to take a public stand. People need to realize we are different. Amen. Another quick office max story. And sometimes I'm there and I, I wear a dress shirt and tie and not a suit, but I wear dress shoes too. And so it ha happens every couple of weeks, somebody comes up to me and starts asking me questions about the store or to find something. I can tell them, I, I, don't, I don't work here. I work here. And they go, oh, I'm sorry. I said, that's all right. I take it as a compliment when you do that. But people do that all the time because I look like I work there. By how I'm dressed, they, people uh, think I'm, I'm working there at Office Max. Christian, we ought to know that when people look at us, they think there must be a Christian there. Because there's a difference. There's a difference. A public stand. Others will recognize when you've been on the mountaintop. Yeah, our relatives, our friends, people we know, they'll know we've been to church. They'll know you've had a time with the Lord in, in prayer and personal Bible study. You can go to the mountaintop more than once. Praise the Lord for that. I like going to the mountaintop all the time. And there's coming a day, Christian, when we'll go to the mountaintop and never come back. What a day that's going to be, isn't it? Yeah. And we can't stay on the mountaintop. God's called us to do a work. It's kind of a, can I say this? It's a dirty work. It's a tough work. We're out there in the world that doesn't make, that doesn't make us feel comfortable either. So we make them feel uncomfortable. They make us feel uncomfortable. But that's just the way it is. But the work is that important. That important. And God has called us to be like the Lord Jesus Christ in this sense. In being an example of what to say to this world. So have a personal mountaintop experience with the Lord often. When you're alone with God, learning His Word, being blessed by that special time, but then coming back to do the job He's called us to do too. But more prepared, more prepared, stronger, better than we ever have before. Heavenly Father, as we consider these thoughts now, what happens when a person has a personal experience, a mountaintop experience with the Lord, the evidence that's there, just like Moses, when he got that special time with you up on that mountaintop, but he had to come down to do the work too, to straighten things out, to correct things, and show people where they're wrong, and show people where they're right, when it is right. So Lord, help us to be those kind of people, like, like a Moses too. Help us to realize he calls your great work and important work and eternal work. So may we be faithful. So Lord, please bless now. Bless now as we have this time of invitation to have a prayer. Maybe invite someone to walk the aisle this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To walk the aisle, kneel down here as if they're kneeling before the Lord Jesus Christ because that what is what it would mean. That is what it means. So bless now this special time, the invitation to prayer time. In Jesus' name we do ask it. Amen.